I invite you to take a deep breath for a moment and let go. Let go of this space, of this time, and of this place. And imagine with me that you're in a desert. Now at 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning, the heat is starting to build. But it's only going to be about 85 degrees today. And it's a dry heat. There hasn't been any rain since May. There's a clear blue sky. And you can feel the warmth of the sun and the power of the sun on your skin. There's a slight breeze that's blowing, and it's kind of ruffling your clothing, cooling you down a little as the sweat evaporates, and raising the dust into little eddies that, right, that get caught, the little dervishes that get caught between the rocks and the sand. You look out over the camp, and you see tents, tents that have been set up as best as they can amongst the rocks and the sand and the sand and the rocks and the rocks and the sand. There's not much green that breaks this wilderness, breaks the monotony. You swallow, or at least you try to swallow, but your mouth is dry and gritty with dust. Your tongue feels thick. You woke before sunrise, thirsty. Now, you had a cup of tea as the dawn broke, but that was hours ago, and you're still thirsty. Water rations are low, and oh, you crave a long drink of cool, satisfying, fresh water. But you can't have one. As a leader of this group, you have to set a disciplined example and of self-control of how to cope when the water is low. The name of this place is Rephidim, meaning refresh. But you're not feeling refreshed this morning. You're feeling parched, dry, cranky, and parched. And those around you are also parched. They're tired and cranky and dry and parched, and they're getting angry. They're angry and they're afraid. They miss following their daily routines, even if those <coughs> routines were bitter routines of slavery. And they miss the sweet water of the last camp. And they miss knowing for certain what lies ahead. And they miss knowing when they're going to find that next drink of living water from a spring. And the camp is full of grumbling and murmuring and even threats. Desperate, thirsty people will go to desperate measures to feed their children and nourish their children. And you can feel the fear and desperation building and building into anger. Anger against God and anger against <coughs> you, the leader. What are you going to do? Moses prayed. He cried to God, what am I going to do with these people? They're ready to stone me. And God answered with directions of the place to go and the actions to take. God made water flow from a rock, living rot water from a hard, dry rock, life from a place of death. And the Bible reminds us that God is powerful and can work in situations where we only feel bad. And it can, God can bring forth life in circumstances in which we fear only death. If I withhold my heart from the story, then I want to ask, hey, why didn't those Israelis, Israelites just start praying sooner? They already had been given manna from heaven and quails at night, and they'd already had their water problem solved once before in, in Mira, where the water was bitter. God made it sweet, so why didn't they have
have the common sense to just start pray, praying. But if I let myself become involved in the story, if I allow myself to feel that thirst and picture myself holding my grandbabies while their limbs go limp and the eyes fall back into their skulls as they dehydrate and slowly die, then I can feel that fear and desperation. And the question of water becomes a question of God's presence as death creeps into that camp. If God is among us, how can we suffer so? It takes a really mature faith to continue to trust God in the wilderness times, to stay calm and focused in the face of our fear. Time after time through the Bible, God brings a solution of life out of a solution of death, but we can only find that solution when we are not overwhelmed by fear, when we're not so focused on the problem that we ignore our creativity, our imagination, and the firm hope of God's grace. One billion people on our planet do not have a reliable source of water. 2.4 billion people on our planet have inadequate sanitation. Two million children die each year because they're dehydrated and malnourished, and that just makes them so susceptible to those diseases that come with poor sanitation. For some of us, this might be new information. For some of us, it doesn't matter because it's coming from someplace else. Maybe we're holding our hearts apart from the situation because it scares us. The fear paralyzes us, and the situation is just too enormous to cope with. But for the men and the women and the children, this thirst is real. The lack of clean, drinkable water is a life and death challenge. As the drought and famine persist, the frustrations mount, and fear can turn to anger, and in their misery they may ask, is God among us? As I watched the following UNICEF video about thirst in the Horn of Africa, I could sense some of that desperate energy in the crowd, the same energy that must have been amongst the thirsty Israelites. Watch the video, decide for yourself. Did you see the desperation in the people at the beginning of the film? Some of the women were running to get a share of the, work, of the food and becoming entangled in barbed wire. And then the announcer focused the blame on ineffective government that has allowed 20 years of civil war. And in the end, it's the children we see, tired and hungry and thirsty and dying slowly. And the announcer asks, if we would let our children die like this. You can't really hold your heart apart from the suffering when you see this kind of image. You don't have to, because God is calling. Our passage in Exodus says, I will be there, I will stand before you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out so the people may drink. After, Jesus, after Moses prays, he has to go and do so that the people will have water. God shows the way. God is present. And when the people are thirsty, we have to pray. And then we have to go and do. We have to participate in God's plan. We have to move through our fear to use our God-given creativity and imagination and hope in God's grace so that others can go and dig the wells, <coughs> give the hand pumps, install the water filtration systems, and educate the whole community so the water source is protected with good sanitation practices. In Sunday School this morning, we saw two additional films about the growing success in safe community water sources. 
Clean water for Liber Liberia was produced by the United Methodist Church and Water for Life by the Church World Services and each told about the wonderful changes that fresh water br brings to a community. Yes, the people are healthier, but also the women walk less. And those of us who will go out and walk this afternoon, some of us will be walking just under the 3.6 miles that women and young girls have to walk every day just to get their families water. When the water is located in their community, then they have times for other things like irrigating their gardens or taking on a side business. And the children, freed from fetching water, can go to school. One of my friends, Jill Hendreth, is a cave diver. She swims in the plumbing of our planet to map out the aquifers under the Earth's surface so that the root of our drinking water is known. She says that in America, fear reigns. Fear of killer diseases, fear of killer storms, killer bees, and even killer toyotas. But her research <coughs> into the Earth's water suggests that a valid fear would be the loss of the planet's clean water. She challenges us to face our fears with creativity and hope. She challenges politicians to be brave enough to pass bold decisions that might not have an effect until after they've left office. And she challenges us with the things that we can go and do, like losing our love affair with our golf course lawns and refilling our water bottles with tap water conserving every drop of water like we didn't know where the next would come from. Our local actions make a difference in the world's water supply. This afternoon we're walking so that others can go to the distressed areas and build the water and sanitation systems and teach the people how to protect their water source. The Israelites were driven by their thirst to wonder if they had been abandoned by God in the wilderness. When we're going through our own painful wilderness time, we might wonder if God has forgotten us. When we watch the news coming from the Horn of Africa and see those startling, heart-wrenching images, we could wonder if God has given up on the people of that region. But Gandhi taught us there are people in the world so thirsty that God cannot appear to them except as water. God is with the people of Africa. God is with us, waiting for our prayers, suffering each loss with us, planning out a way of bringing living water from a rock and calling us to be part of that plan. Gandhi also said, a small body of determined spirits, fired by an unquenchable faith in their mission, can alter the course of history. Our church can be a spirit-filled body of unquenchable faith and show Christ's presence to the hungry, to the thirsty, both globally and right here in our own community. Jesus put it so simply when he taught us that whatever we do for the least of our brothers and sisters in our world, we do it for Christ. Amen.